Good morning. Good to see everybody back. It's good to have a good crowd again. It's been uh, the last couple of weeks have been down, uh, I think, due to uh, Thanksgiving and COVID and deer season and everything else that goes on in Arkansas this time of year. A few announcements. One, it's good to have Miss Joan back at the piano. She's back for her first day back since her surgery. Also good to see Buddy and Nancy back in service today. They are well and uh, here, and then uh, I'm sure there are others as well. Let's see, I see Carol Calvert coming in the back there, so he's here. It's good to have him back. Uh, and if you've been gone for a while, it's good to have you too, all right? So I will just say that. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, Celebrate Recovery, as they are every Monday night, they meet at 5.30. They'll be meeting uh, tomorrow night here in the sanctuary. They would love to have you. Mission Possible will continue this Wednesday night, and there's, uh, there's a little something special this Wednesday night. going to meet with uh, Moses online, one of our missionaries in Africa this Wednesday night. And uh, so he will be meeting by uh, Zoom this Wednesday night with the kids, and so... Uh, bring your kids Wednesday night at 6 o'clock uh, for that. Uh, all other Wednesday night events, Bible study, adult Bible study happens here in the sanctuary at 6, and then the youth group happens downstairs. I don't know what all their times are, but Paul does, and they do, and we pick them up from school and bring them back here. Uh, they have a little bit different schedule than the rest of us, but it all happens on Wednesday nights, and it'll be happening this Wednesday night. As well, December the 13th, which is next Sunday. But Paul, you want to tell us about December the 13th that night? Absolutely. Next, next Sunday night, we are planning on having a Christmas program. And we weren't sure if we were going to be able to have one this year. But we are planning to move forward with one. And got a little bit of a drama and got a little bit of music here with, uh, with some of our choir members. Uh, it'll look different like, than it has from years past, but it will still be a Christmas program. So uh, next week at, at 6 o'clock, Sunday evening, meet with us, and we'll celebrate celebrate Christmas uh, with our Christmas program. Amen. And next Sunday night, we're not going to have uh, our normal big fellowship back in the back. Obviously, it's uh, still COVID season. Uh, but as you can see, we can uh, socially distance quite a few um, in the sanctuary. So you come next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, for... That and then, of course, on December the seventeenth, it's Man Church Night. The third Thursday of every month is Man Church. We start at six thirty. We'd love to have any of you, your men, that night. Uh, we also are going to man the storehouse food pantry this year. It's awful close to Christmas. It's on the twenty third and the twenty sixth. So, if you would like to help, if you're going to be in town during that time and would like to help out with the food pantry, I know that they would love to have you. You can see Brooke Biddle or Christy Higgins. Brooks over here, she's waving at you. Christy is, she's over here too, right behind you. So you see either one of those ladies and they'll get you signed up to help out with the food pantry. All right, if you are a guest with us today, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to reach and grab your cell phone. We have several guests with us today. Take out your cell phone. Go ahead, go ahead, let's do it. Take out your cell phone, and uh, the, the phone number is up on the screen. That's my personal cell phone number. If you will, if you text, uh, please text that number if you, and let me know that you've been here to worship with us today. If you don't text, then save that number into your phone and give me a phone call this week. Just say I was here uh, to worship with you on Sunday. It would be a great privilege and honor to be able to talk with you uh, in that way. There are multiple ways to give at Westside. You can give in our giving stations. We used to pass an offering plate around, uh, but we don't do that now because of the virus. And so we have giving stations. We have two. Uh, there's one out here in this hallway, and there's one back here in this one. As you leave, you'll pass by their wooden boxes over to the side. And if you are looking for a way to give at Westside, we'd love for you to give in that way. Also, uh, we would uh, encourage you to go online and give in that way as well. If you Google Westside First Baptist Church Careers Ferry, you'll find it. And uh, it's very simple, very easy to give in that way. Or if you're on Facebook, if you look us up on Facebook, Westside FBC, uh, it'll uh, lead you and guide you in how to give in that way. If you've got questions about giving, uh, please certainly let us know. And we don't talk about giving every single Sunday, but just every so often we want to highlight that. 
It is the last Sunday of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And so if you haven't thought about how to give uh, to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, then please uh, begin to think about that. And I think we probably still have some brochures. Are they out on the Welcome Center? There are some out on the Welcome Center. So if you didn't get a brochure that has every day of prayer uh, in it, then please pick one up as you leave. There's also an envelope in there. Everything you put into that envelope or everything you give online to Lottie Moon Christmas Offering goes overseas to international missions. And y'all, I'm telling you, it's a big deal. It is a big deal to give in that way. There will be missionaries that will be pulled off the field and not be sharing the gospel any longer overseas if we don't have uh, the offering where it needs to be a Southern Baptist. So give, give, give in that way. And again, every dollar counts. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I promote every special offering that we have, I guess, but uh, this one is major. It's major. Uh, and so you pray about what God would have you individually to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Well, again, it's good to see everybody today. Brother Roger, go ahead and make your way up. Brother Roger is our associate pastor here, and uh, he generally begins our worship service in a time of prayer. So, Brother Roger, pray for us. You know, it's that time of year at Christmas where you always, as a child, anticipate Christmas Day. You know, as a child, I remember right after Thanksgiving was the big event. Sears and Roebuck put out their Christmas catalog. And we would drive down and pick one up because you had to go to the store. And there was always beside that big, thick catalog, the toy catalog. Y'all remember that? No, you don't. That was after your time or before your time. It was great. And my mom would give me that catalog and say, now you go through here and you circle what you would like to have for Christmas. In later years, she told me they took that catalog and then just put it in the trash because I circled everything and it was meaningless. But anticipation. You remember what it's like to be living with a great anticipation. You know, I was reading in the Bible where Moses would go into the tabernacle and the people would all stand and watch the tabernacle while Moses was in there, anticipating the word that he would come back from God, that he would bring out to them and say, this is the word of God. You know, Sundays become routine, and I don't know if, we really should have that anticipation like a child, an anticipation of our heart. What is God going to say to us today? What has the Lord given to our pastor to speak into our hearts today? Are you excited to come and be in service and say, thus saith the Lord, what will it be to my heart today? I want us to stand and I would like for you in your heart just to think in terms of looking to God and saying, Lord, speak to my heart today. May this message from our pastor today be unto us. And give me that great excitement of waiting to hear his word. Let's pray. Now, Father, we come, and we want to come as children. Father, children with that excitement, looking unto Father that has given us a gift of life. Father, today you have given our pastor a message. And Father, we want to have that joy of a child in our heart waiting to hear it. Father, waiting to apply it. And so Lord, today, hear your children as we pray and lift up before you. Speak to our hearts. Father, speak into our lives that we may know your perfect gift and we may know the eternal life that you've given us through our Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, bless our pastor, watch over him, be with him, and Father, may your spirit be upon him today as he speaks with us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is alive, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. 
every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. So open up.
today, Lord, that we have hope in Jesus. And Lord, I pray if there be one in this room, Lord, or one watching online, Father, that does not yet know the hope that is offered through Christ, through the cross and the resurrection, Father, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Today would be the day that they come to know you and seek you as Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you would move and work in our hearts, draw us closer to you, speak through the special music and through the reading and the preaching of your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. This, uh, this part of our service is called special music. 
And what I want to share with you this morning, in, in my opinion, is just, is just way beyond the word special. If you're visiting with us, our, our young music minister uh, is Paul McCarty, and I believe his dad would confess and tell us that uh, he got his musical ability from his mama. His, his mama's name is Joy McCarty. Miss Joy uh, passed away of cancer years and years and years ago. And uh, I remember in the old sanctuary how when she was battling cancer, she sat at the piano and sang a song called I'll Pray For You. And that had such an impact on me that I still remember it all these years uh, back. She sang not only a song, she sang a message. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, she blessed our church back then. And now, if y'all would listen, 30 years later, she can bless our church again. This is Miss Joy McCarty.
Amen. If you got your Bibles, make your way to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. What an amazing thing technology is, right? 30 years later, still blessing hearts and uh, still um, hearing from someone's heart that has went on to be with the Lord. If you are a child, ages 3 through kindergarten, we're going to dismiss you to Children's Church if you'd like to go. Uh, our workers are ready over to the side, be one or two. One's not going unless Mama goes. I know. I've seen that. So Mama, just take her back. <laughs> they have that discussion every Sunday, and she looks at her, and I can just see her. She just shakes her head like, no, I'm still not going to go by myself unless you take me back there. Well, I don't know about at your house, but at my house, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. What about your house? I know it's 2020, we've been through a lot, but the Christmas tree is up, the lights are on, they never go off at my house, they're on night and day at all times. My wife, if she could, would leave the Christmas tree up 12 months out of the year, and, and she would glitterize the whole house. Any men know what I'm talking about? It's everywhere, it's everywhere. And then she's got these little, uh, what do you call those little? A Christmas village house. And, and for her birthday, her birthday was this last week, and, and she, got, uh, she got Christmas village people. Christmas village people. One's throwing a snowball at the other one. And uh, she was so excited, and I said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's wonderful, wonderful. Buy me a fishing rod, but that's great. If you want that, that's wonderful, wonderful. And, and the other night, she, had, she started turning lights off. And I flipped them back on and said, I'm not ready to turn. She said, I have to take a picture of my Christmas village with my Christmas village people for my friends. That's what she said, for my friends. And so I said, for your friends? She said, yeah, they've asked for a picture of the Christmas village. And I went, well, there's more than one woman out there like this. I didn't know. Uh, I did not know. And at my house, the Christmas presents are bought. We start early because Christmas is a big deal at my, my house. And, and if the lady who normally decorates, if she weren't at home sick, this whole sanctuary would be decorated for Christmas, that time of year. 2020 can't take that away from us, can it? We're going to decorate. We're going to have a good time at Christmas. I want to talk to you today on the idea, get ready, a bloody Bethlehem. I, I want you to see that some of the stuff that we do for Christmas, though there may not be anything wrong with it, I want to remind you what Christmas is really all about. Stand with me on the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 16. The Bible says, Then Herod... When he saw that he had been outwitted by the wise men, he flew into a rage and he gave orders to massacre all the male children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because there were no more. They, excuse me, they were no more. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. Father, I pray today that the truth of the gospel would shine forth today. Father, I pray if there's someone here in this room or someone that is watching online, Father, that if they do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they would before this day's over. Father, remind us what Christmas really looked like, the first one. Father, help us. Lord, we've so materialized everything around Christmas. Father, we've made idols out of some things that we should not. Father, help us to begin the first Sunday in December. Father, to begin this Christmas season with a reminder of our Savior. Father, if there's some in this room that have been away from you for so long, but, Lord, you would draw them back to yourself. Father, I pray today would do that very thing. Father, help me to say those things you have me to say. 
Help me not to say those things you'd have me not to say. Father, you lead us. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Chuck Swindoll writes that it was the year 1809. The international scene was tumultuous, to say the least. Napoleon was sweeping through Austria. Blood was flowing freely. Nobody then cared about babies. But the world was overlooking some terribly significant births in 1809. For example, William Gladstone was born that year. He was destined to become one of England's finest statesmen. The same year, Alfred Tennyson was born to an obscure minister and his wife. The child would one day greatly affect the literary world in a marked manner. On the American continent, Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and not far away in Boston, Edgar Allan Poe began his eventful, albeit very tragic, life, Swindoll writes. It was also in that same year that a physician named Darwin and his wife named their child Charles Robert. That same year produced the cries of a newborn infant in a rugged log cabin in Hardin County, Kentucky. The baby's name, Abraham Lincoln. Swindoll writes and says, If there had been news broadcast at the time, I'm certain these events would have been heard. The destiny of the world is being shaped on an Austrian battlefield today. But history was actually being shaped in the cradles of England and America. In the same way, Bethlehem birthed a Messiah. Though there were so many things that were happening in the day, Herod was king. God's people were under bondage of the Roman authority. Absolutely. There had been some 400 years of silence from Malachi to Matthew. There was... Not a voice from heaven, not a prophetic utterance from heaven in over 400 years. God's people were waning. God's people were wondering. God's people were looking forward to the day that the Messiah would come and overthrow Roman bondage and give them great freedom in the same way that Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. They expected the Messiah to do the same. That's what they were looking for, and yet Jesus, the baby, is what they got. That first Christmas morning is beautiful, isn't it? We celebrate it. There's not a Christmas that goes by that most rural churches don't have some type of Christmas pageant, though 2020 may change that, certainly. Where kids get up and one is messing with the other one's hair and two children, a little boy and a little girl, they play Mary and Joseph. They're supposed to be madly in love with each other and they hate each other's guts. And they stand on a platform with a fake smile and a fake baby, and we celebrate Christmas. And yet that first Christmas morning looked very different, did it not? It would smell very different. It was in a cave, as we say. We, we, we in the South say it was in a stable, in a barn, but it was really in a cave. It was a place that was on the outskirts of town. We know why. Because when they went to town, there was no room for them in the inn, right? That's the one line that every kid wants in the Christmas play, just to walk out and say, there is no room in the inn and shut the door, right? He was born in a place of manure, a place of tragedy. And yet, when that baby breathed his first breath here, God had become flesh. It was a great day for the Christian. Matter of fact, we would say it's the beginning day for the Christian, for the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Christ. That is the Christ child. That is the Messiah. Now, some of you know a little bit about Bible uh, history, and you say, well, why did you begin here? Jesus wasn't even a newborn at this point. That's why Herod had all of them killed two years old and under because he didn't know how old he was. He knew he could be two. He knew he could be also a newborn. Why? Because the wise men had come. If you look back 
in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived unexpectedly in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king in verse 9, they went on their way. And there it was, the star that had been in the east. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed beyond measure. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. So you've got King Herod. Who is this king? He was one bad dude, I'm telling you. You think 2020 was bad? I mean, you ought to look at the life of King Herod. King Herod, and by the way, that's point number one, is a corrupt society. He was the leader of a corrupt society. And he was not only just a leader, but he was an example of a corrupt society. Herod represents all that's wrong and evil in society both then and now. Herod was a guy who only cared about Herod. He's the only one he was worried about. He lived for numero uno. He was all about self. He was one of the most prideful, one of the most arrogant human beings ever walked planet Earth. Not only that, but he recreated himself over and over and over again through his children who just became more conceited as the years rocked on. He believed not only was he king, but he was God. And he used his power and his kingship and his politics. Y'all ever heard of that? That's a bad word, isn't it? Dirty word. Well, it was dirtier in Herod's day than you ever thought today. And we talk about fake votes and stealing votes and making up votes and dead people votes. Well, there was no vote in Herod's day. You see, he was king. Herod would not only kill some of his wives but some of his children as well when he thought that his throne was in jeopardy again it was all about Herod it was all about him it was all about him being in charge and I will be the king and anyone he thought was coming after his kingdom was coming after his throne he killed them that's just the way it worked in Herod's day that's why you see Herod listening to the wise men, and what the wise men say, we're looking for the one who was born who? King of the Jews. Herod says, now wait a minute. I'm king of the Jews. I'm the one who rebuilt their temple for them. Solomon built the first one, but Herod built the next one. He's the one who is known in that day as king of the Jews. What do you mean, king of the Jews? I'm king of the Jews. There's another one being born? And so he goes and he gets the... Pharisees, he gets those who would know the scripture and he brings them in and he says, where will the Messiah be born? And they said, Bethlehem, Bethlehem. And so Herod says, go and you find him, come back so that I can go worship this one that was born king of the Jews. Now you and I both know he did not want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill him. Why? Numero uno, it's about me Myself and I. And he says, anybody that is born that is a son who might jeopardize my kingdom, my kingship, my throne, 
I will have them killed. Again, he killed some of his kids and some of his wives when he thought that they might try to take his throne. One bad guy. One bad guy. He was the political leader of the day. If you wanted it done, you went through Herod. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, you know, I've just noticed in the last month or so, there was an election. Y'all noticed? And, and it doesn't matter when there's an election. Some people are happy. Some people are unhappy. Some people are desperately sad. The world is going to come to an end because someone was elected. And it doesn't matter who's elected. I mean, in this last election, had it been Trump, then all the Biden supporters would have been, oh, it's going to be the end of the world. And if it was Biden, then all the Trump supporters would say, well, oh, my goodness, why do I say it like that? Because we really don't know who won yet. May I just tell you that they didn't kill the real king in Bethlehem? And can I just say it how we would in South Arkansas? He still ain't dead. I'm not worshiping anyone in Washington. I'm worshiping Jesus, the King of glory. It was a corrupt society then. Y'all, it's a corrupt society now. We look around in 2020 and we say, my goodness, look at how horrible and how terrible it is in 2020. And so for 2021, I'm going to tell you, you may get what you want. It may get worse. Society has always been corrupt. Society has always been bad. Why? Because you and I live in a fallen world. Now you just get to see it in the headlines every day. But it's always been there. Corruption and wickedness is there. Listen, it's inside of you because of who we are. We were born this way. We didn't ask for it, but we've got it. And you say, well, if we could go back to the Garden of Eden, you'd have eaten the fruit too. That's what would have happened. It's who we are. The, the Bible says that even God's people are bent to backsliding, bent to going away from God, not bent to going towards Him. In Romans chapter 3, and you know these verses well, the Apostle Paul writes and says, What then? Are we better? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Gentiles were all under sin. When he makes that statement in that day, he's saying that every human being on planet Earth were all under sin. He would say today that the northerners and the southerners in the United States of America are all under sin. If he were to say it today, he would say the Democrats and the Republicans are all under sin. Everyone is level. We are all sinners. In verse 10, it says, as it is written. And he goes into this long line of thought of just telling us how bad we really are. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become useless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. In the path of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Everybody feeling good about yourself so far? Thanks, Paul. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 through 4. What the law could not do, since it was limited by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in flesh like ours under sin's domain and as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. The Apostle Paul says we're all bad. The Apostle Paul says when you look at Herod, you ought to see yourself there. Anybody ever been selfish in the room? Anybody ever worried about what somebody else would think and tried to take care of yourself? That's what Herod's doing. Now, it's a whole other level, I'll agree. I mean, I've never thought about someone wanting to become pastor of this church and 
well, you know, they may want my job, so let's just kill them. I've never thought that. I mean, it's just not crossed my mind. I've not looked at one of my two boys. I mean, I've thought about killing them, but for other reasons. But I've never looked at one of my two boys and said, you know, they might, they might take my church from me. Let's just kill them. I, I mean, I don't even understand that, that thought process, but I do understand this. The sinfulness of Herod, I get it. You know why I get it? I looked at it this morning in the mirror. We're all sinners. We're all on level playing field. You say, I'm not on level playing field, preacher. Yes, you are. See, you struggle with pride and arrogancy. You say, no, I'm, I'm not on the same playing field as, as, as other folks. I mean, I'm not like a, uh, I mean, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not a drug addict, I'm not a murderer. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, if you are so good and yet you look at someone, and you have hatred against them in your heart, what have you done? You've murdered them. In your heart. Now, let's not raise our hands, but who has done that? We all have. We all have. He says that if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, what is he? He's committed adultery. By the way, that's for ladies that look at men the same way, all right? If we were to have a show of hands, every hand in this room would have to go up to say, we are a sinner. Herod was a sinner. He was sinfulness on display. You may keep yours hidden at home in the closet a little better than he did, but he was sinfulness on display. He was corruption at its worst. Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman told of a distinguished minister Dr. Howard from Australia, who preached very strongly on the subject of sin. And, and really, to be honest, there may be some of you in this room a little, uh, I wish he'd slow down. I wish he'd back off just a little bit. I can't believe he would be so stern on sin. Dr. Howard went through the same issue. And, and after the service, one of the church officials came to counsel with him in his study and said, Dr. Howard, we don't want you to talk as openly as you do about man's guilt and corruption. Because if our boys and girls hear you discussing the subject, they will uh, more easily uh, become sinners. Call it a mistake, if you will, but do not speak so plainly about sin. The minister took down a small bottle and showed it to the visitor and said, Do you see that label? It says strychnine. And underneath in bold and red letters the word poison. Do you know what you are asking me to do? You are suggesting that I change the label. Suppose I do paste over the words, essence of peppermint. Don't you see what might happen? Someone would use it not knowing the danger involved and would certainly die. So it is, too, with the matter of sin, Dr. Howard said. The milder you make the label, the more dangerous you make the poison. I, I know it's Christmas. I know. We, we're all supposed to, well, we're not supposed to hold hands. All right? We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to stand six foot apart and maybe put our palms out toward each other. But I'm sure if you ask the media, that would give us the coronavirus. So maybe we're not even supposed to do that. But it's supposed to be nice. It's supposed to be kind. Let me tell you, the nicest thing you've ever had anyone do for you in your life is tell you you are a sinner without Christ. Because until you hear those words, you'll never be found by Christ. Herod was corruption at his worst. I mean, he was one bad guy. And let me just say this before I move on, because we're going to move on, I promise you. Bad things happen in this life. They do. You live long enough, you see it. People don't live forever. I hate it. I don't like it. I, I, I told the story, I think it was last week, about going, and we had Thanksgiving without someone who's been a part of my family all my life, my grandfather, for the first time. That's not easy. To be honest, I just wanted uh, that Thursday, Thanksgiving, just get out of here. I mean, let's just get on with it. It's hard. It's difficult. Bad things happen in this life. 
Pandemics come, pandemics go. We live in a fallen world. What should we do as Christians when we see it on display in the same way that we've seen it in these last few months? Look up. Look up. Be reminded it's not all about you. It's not all about your life. The football coach for the Arkansas Razorbacks, when he had coronavirus, they ask him while he's in quarantine, they ask him how he's doing. And he said, when I grew up, and I won't use every word that he used, he didn't cuss, all right? But it's just not language all they use from the pulpit. But he said that his grandfather said, and I quote, that this world doesn't revolve around your, I'll just say, rear end. But he said, in the last few days, it seems like it has because of all the prayers and all the concern I've had from fans of the Arkansas Razorbacks. As you look around this world, you need to understand this world doesn't revolve around your rear end, all right? It just doesn't. You need to understand that the world doesn't revolve around America's needs. It doesn't. It revolves on the axis of what God wills. He is in charge. And when you see death and you see hard times around you, you need to be reminded that, you know what, you're not all in charge. You don't have everything uh, covered in your own life. Some of you thought you'd get together with family this year, but you couldn't. Some of you thought you'd let this be the best year of your life, and it sure hasn't been. It's been tough. It's been hard. It's not been easy. Listen, if you're looking for sympathy, don't come to the Baptist preacher, because I'm telling you, we built a new sanctuary, and we had this thing full of people, and then a pandemic comes. So you're not going to get a lot of sympathy from me. I'm just going to tell you, we're all going to... Not hold hands, put our palms toward each other six foot apart, and we're going to get through this thing together. But I promise you, what I've been reminded of, you know what? You thought you had it all under control, but you don't. It's all in God's hands. We're called people of faith for a reason. You don't have faith in something you see. You have faith in something you believe. Now listen, it's a substantial faith. It's a faith that's backed up by much much fact in the Word of God. It's not only a faith that's backed up by much fact, but every prophecy that God has ever given has come to fulfillment except those that are yet to come. But I'm telling you, what He says, it is settled. Trust Him. A corrupt society. We still live in a corrupt society, y'all. Point number two is a Christmas statue. Now listen, that's not found in the Scripture, but I'm not making it up. We have them. And I'm not talking about Christmas trees and Santa Claus. and I, I'm, I'm not getting into that. But I'm going to tell you, we've made Christmas something that Christmas is not. We've made Christmas something that, you know, being Crosby in the background and all of that. You know, I was thinking as, as uh, Roger was talking about that, uh, that, that Christmas catalog, he, he misspoke. He, he didn't mean to say this, but he said that some of you were pre-Christmas catalog and, and what he meant to say is that some of you were post the Christmas catalog. You came along after the Christmas catalog. But I thought, boy, he's talking to Ray Moore right there. Because I know there was no Christmas catalog when Ray Moore was growing up. It couldn't have been. How many of you learned to drive sitting on one of those things? I, I did. Yeah, I knew exactly what that was. And I remember sitting there with all my cousins at Christmas. And we would sit there and, boy, we'd circle... And, and, and before you know it, about everything circled. I mean, we about got the whole book circled. Roger was exactly right. We, we wanted it all, man. And, and really, when I was growing up, I mean, they were, I guess there were bad things happening, but I didn't know it. I, I just didn't know it. Uh, now, kids are growing up understanding there's bad things out there. You know, I hate that for my children. I, I wish my children could grow up in the same way that I did, just thinking everything's fine. Everything's fine. Now they, they have to put on a mask to walk in. We'll go into a restaurant uh, for lunch today, and we'll walk in. We have to have a mask on when we walk in. Why? Because we might get a virus and die. That there's a point zero zero two percent chance that we die from. That's the world that they're growing up in. And you and I have let it happen. Christmas statue. What, what, what do you think of when you, you think of, uh, of Christmas? You don't, think of a, you don't think of a feeding trough. You don't think of manure. You don't think of those things. Hey, 
You don't think of a bloody cross. And yet that's what Christmas is all about. So what did Herod do? Well, he couldn't find them, so he said, well, let's kill them. What we'll do is we'll kill every male child two years and under. Now, an angel comes to Mary and Joseph and says, get out. Get out. Why? Because nobody's going to kill God's kid. It's not going to happen. God's not going to allow it. So he has them get out. They, they know the news before the news ever happens. You know why? Because they serve the God who knows the end before there is a beginning. And then so God comes and sends an angel and says, get out. So they get out of Dodge and the, the, the wise men don't come back. And so what happens? Herod says, kill them. It's estimated that some 14,000 babies were killed during this time. If you could go back to Bethlehem, if you could ask some of those mothers, what does Christmas mean to you that lost their son? That had men come in armed with swords and put a sword through their child. Can you imagine? as bad and horrible and wicked as what we have going on now with abortion. But can you imagine? What would they say Christmas meant to them? What would they say that that year meant to them? It meant the loss of their child. It was bloodstained. It was done so that prophecy would be fulfilled. Now you say, God's at the heart of the killing of the innocent. No. No. God's not at the heart of it, but he did allow it to take place. As a matter of fact, he prophesied years before that it would take place. Why? Because he knows the future. If he didn't know the future, he wouldn't be God. In verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children. He refused to be consoled because they were no more. Bloody, horrible, wicked. Don't make Christmas something that it is not. It's not about a tree and it's not about Santa and it's not even about the gifts that we give. Though the reason we give the gifts is because of the greatest gift that was ever given. But remember, it's about a Messiah that came. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 14 that the Word became flesh and took up residence among us. And we observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son of God, full of grace and truth. When Jesus was born, it meant war. When the Word became flesh in Bethlehem in that, and was laid in that feeding trough, there was an all-out assault and war from the pits of hell to try to kill the child. If we can kill the child and keep him from the cross, we win. And so war begins to break out. And Satan uses men like Herod to try to kill the child. Satan's desire was to stop Jesus before the cross, and he would use any means necessary to stop the child before the cross. But you see, the difference between Satan and us is we know our God. And we know that Satan will not overcome our God. I said, we know that Satan will not overcome our God. I know I'm talking fast, but that's a good place to amen. I mean, it looks like hell is winning on the outside, but we need to teach our children that it's not winning on the outside. No, sir. Our God not only is not losing, but he has already won. We have victory. I'm not waiting to go to heaven to have I have victory right now because I have Jesus in my heart. I am blessed in the midst of chaos. Why? Because I know who holds it all together. I trust him. There are people in this room who had this virus, and I checked on them. I prayed for them. I texted them. What can I do? What can I bring? I want to do something. But I was not swayed that God was in control because a few people had a virus. And by the way, I don't know who our next president will be. I'm not sure anybody does, and who knows what will happen in January. The whole world may come to an end in January, and if it does, I'm a going home. I'm not worried. Am I concerned? Sure, I'm concerned. I live in America. 
How could you not be concerned? You wouldn't be an American if you weren't concerned about your nation. I pray for this nation. I pray for our leaders, be they Republican or Democrat or Independent or anything in between, to wake up. But I'm not worried. I go to bed and sleep good almost every night unless my daughter comes in and kicks me. I'm not worried. I know who's in control. This Christmas, remember what President James A. Garfield once called history, the unrolled scroll of prophecy. That's what we're seeing around us. As God is unrolling his scroll to reveal what he is up to around us. You know, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 12 says this, I watch over my word to accomplish it. To accomplish it. Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem. You know why? God said he would. And he watches over it. He, he's going to accomplish his word. If he's promised to be with us and never leave us, never forsake us, then don't make a statue out of that tree. Worship the king. He will. He will. If, if he's promised to, to bless the church, that preaches the gospel, and he has, you know what he'll do? He will. He will. And can I just say this? In our church, well, we got visitors with us probably from other churches, and that's great. Hope he blesses you. But I'm telling you, in this church, we are very, very blessed. We have no complaints. We're very blessed here. Point number three is this, a coming Savior. Now, you know that Christmas was about Jesus. You know that. You know that the coming Savior is what Christmas is all about. You know that very corny uh, expression, but it's very true that he is the reason for the season. That's exactly right. And he is. And he is. And he will forever be the real reason for the season. I know people in this area that I know do not believe Jesus is the Messiah and yet they've got a Christmas tree up, they've got Christmas decorations up around their house, and they're going to celebrate his birth without even knowing they're celebrating. I know people in this area that do not believe that there is a God, and yet they celebrate at Christmas time. Isn't it kind of funny? God gets the last laugh, doesn't he? The reason we have it is because of the birth of the Messiah. It's not about the big fat men coming down the chimney. It's not about that. It's about the birth of the Messiah. And by the way, do some research in history about old Saint Nick and who he really was and what he was really about. And he was, not only was he a Christian, but he was a warrior for the Christian faith. Don't make it something that it's not. Tell your children and your grandchildren the Christmas story. Tell them the the bloody story of Christmas that Jesus came to live, yes, but to die, to live again, that they might live for all eternity. Can I just tell you this? Christmas is about a Savior who came, but Christmas is a reminder to me that He's coming again. You know, if Scripture was fulfilled, that the Messiah would come, some Bible commentators and scholars would say, well over a hundred prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. If, if Scripture said that he would come and he would be born, not just that he would be born, but that he would be born in Bethlehem, and Scripture even has to say you're not least. Why? Because it's a small, obscure place in the middle of nowhere. And Jesus came. If Scripture taught us that Children would die during those days. And there would be weeping and there would be wailing. And it, that came to, pla- to pass. If Scripture told us that Jesus would be of the Nazarene, and he was. If Scripture told us that he would be hanging on a tree and he would be unrecognizable, as Isaiah says, on the tree before there was a tree to be hanged on. Think about it. If King David would write at least 200 years before crucifixion was invented about crucifixion in great detail, 
if Scripture would say he would come and he would die, but on the third day he would arise from the dead, and if he did, and if he was seen, at least your word tells you of 514 people that saw him. When the Apostle Paul would write to the church at Corinth, he would make the statement, some of you saw him. When he talked about the resurrection of the dead, he said, you saw him raised. If he weren't raised, we won't be raised. But if he was raised, so you too will be raised. If all of that is true, and Scripture says he's coming again, well, guess what you ought to do? You ought to just say, well, he's going to come again. Now, the Bible says that when he comes again, he's going to come like a thief in the night. Any of you ever had a thief come in your home? I, I've never had that. I've been very blessed, and I don't want one tonight, by the way. And if you do come in my home, you need to pray against that 9 millimeter on the other side of that door. And the 12 gauge, and the 270, and the 25, and yeah, because we're loaded, so I'm just letting you know. Like ahead of time. We just put it online. Don't come to the preacher's house because you might get shot. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'd be petrified if somebody was in my home. So I'm going to shoot you if I see you. All right? That's what I'm saying. I never had a thief come in my home. Not that I knew. But if I was going to have one tonight, I got an idea. We can get a postcard last week telling me he's coming. Thieves don't work that way. They slip in. And thanks be unto the Lord that the majority of them try to find a time when you're not at home to come into your home, right? If the Scripture says he's coming like a thief, and it goes even further, a thief in the night. One that you can't see coming because of the darkness. Y'all notice it's getting pretty dark in our culture. The darker it gets here, then the closer the light is to coming. He's coming. He came once, just like he said he would. And he's coming again, just like he said he would. It'll happen. You say, preacher, I've heard preachers say that all my life. And you may hear preachers say it until you die. I do not know when he's coming, nor do you. But one day, somewhere on planet Earth, he'll be a preacher, and he'll be preaching a lot like I am today, talking about Jesus coming again. And in that very moment, he'll show up. Y'all, he's coming. Are you ready? Have you made preparation? Are you sure that if you died, you'd go to heaven? You see, Herod wasn't. But he's living for this life. He was so uncertain about who he was that he was willing to kill every child two years old and less in an entire city. Because he was insecure, unsure, uncertain about life. You, you hear that and you say, oh, I would never do anything like that. But you know what Scripture says? Scripture says if you've broken one of the laws, it's just like killing 14,000 children. It's just as bad. And when you stand before God, he's not going to talk to you about what Herod did. He's not going to talk to you about what Doug did. He's going to talk to you about what you've done. And he's going to ask you, as Evangelism Explosion taught us years and years ago, tell me, why should I let you stay in my heaven? What would be your answer? I'm going to tell you, if it's anything other than the blood of Jesus, you won't get to stay. You'll be the ones that Jesus talked about and said, there'll be many on that day. He'll come and say, I went to church. Went to West Side, member of West Side, been baptized. I read my Bible. I even witnessed. I did all this work. Maybe you'll be one who said, I was on the platform. I sang a song. I, I preached a sermon. And Jesus will look at you and go, well, I'm so sorry. You lived your life in vain. But I never knew you. We never had a relationship. Boy, I hope that's not you. But I want you to know I've got good news. If it is you, it does not have to remain you. 
You can come to know him today. I've told this story before, but I'll never forget one of the deacon's kids in my first church. First time I'd ever really witnessed it. She knew over 300 Bible verses with their reference because of Awana. And she walked the aisle on a Sunday morning just like this, and she said, Brother Doug, I need to be saved. I said, there's no way. No way you need to be saved. You, I know you're saved. She said, no, I'm not. She said, I know the word, but I don't know the word. And we sat down on that front row. You know what happened when she came? Seven others walked the aisle with her. She didn't know. And yet God had been dealing with her that week. God had been talking to her about salvation. And so she just made a decision. She went without her parents' approval because they thought the same thing I did. You got to be saved. I mean, you know, you just doubt. She walked up and she said, no, I'm lost. If I die, I'd go to hell. And I knew I would. And after I got through talking to her, small country church, after I got done talking to her, I, got, I went over here and talked to this one. And then I went over here and talked to this one. You know what somebody said? Somebody, we, we sang through just as I am 35 times today, preacher. Yeah, but there's eight people going to heaven that wasn't before we started. If you need Jesus, you come and we'll stay till you and I get done. I'm telling you, it's important. I'm not telling you it's important because I think he could come today. I'm telling you it's important because the word of God says he could come today. And you could be left behind. It's just a fact. And so if he comes, are you ready? Herod was not ready. Herod was not ready. Herod died a paranoid individual with no relationship with the God that he walked among his people for years. If you died today, do you know? If you don't know, let's get it right. Man, you talk about a good Christmas. When you know Christ, it's just a new day. A new day. You can be a new creation today. You don't have to have that doubt. You can know. Oh, I pray you'd know today. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Listen, if you're here today, and you say, Brother Doug, if I die, I don't, I don't know where I'd go. I, I'm just not sure. M maybe you're, you're like that teenage girl was that day. She thought she knew, but then, but then she just didn't know. If you don't know where you go when you die, why don't you make it right? Maybe you thought you knew at one time, and uh, you said some words, and you, you thought you meant, but you're just not sure. Be sure today. If 2020 has not taught us anything, surely it's taught us that life is very very fleeting here today and gone tomorrow there's no certainty in life the only thing that is certain is that without Jesus you go to a place called hell but with him you can go to heaven would you just talk to him right now if you're not sure just tell him Lord Jesus I'm not certain where I'll go and right now as best I know how I give you my heart I give you my life I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to be ready when you come. So right now, I ask you to come in my heart. You know, if you're here today, and you just said that prayer, meant it with all your heart. For the very first time right now, you say, I, I know I'm saved. And I'm going to encourage you during the invitation to come forward. I'm going to encourage you because I'm telling you, just like I told you the illustration of the young girl when she came forward, seven others followed with her. If you're here today and you made that decision for the very first time today, don't be ashamed of him. He wasn't ashamed of you and he's not ashamed of you now. Let it be known by coming forward today. Maybe you say, Preacher, I'm saved, but my life is such a mess. Such a mess. 
And I'm telling you, he'd be here as the song is being played in the background to welcome you home. Why don't you let him come in? Why don't you come back home to him? Maybe you're here and you're like I was this morning. When you woke up, you're just thankful for all he's done for you. Maybe you need to come and kneel in these altars, do business with him. They're open. You do whatever God's calling you to do. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for this day. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Father, I pray in this moment that you would have full reign and full control. Father, anything you do during this invitation be done for your honor and glory. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. If you need to come, you come as we sing. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you. If you're a guest with us today, we hope you felt at home here at Westside. Uh, normally, we'd shake hands and hug necks and all those things, but it's just weird right now, and so we don't do that, but we wish we could, and we're so grateful that you came to worship with us. Also, normally, I would be back at the door, and I would greet you as you walk out, shake hands with you, and thank you for your visit, but I won't do that today because they tell us we're not supposed to do that, and so I'm trying to do as told it's just hard, y'all. It's just hard. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I'm going to stand up front, but we are so grateful that you came to worship with us today, not just for the guests, but for the members. It's good to see you. It's good to have you in worship today. Come back and worship with us tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going through uh, the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday nights at 6, and Paul will lead us in worship, and I think there's uh, practice for the Christmas play for next Sunday this afternoon, so it's busy around here on Sundays. Come back come back tonight and worship with us, if at all possible. It, again, it's good to see everybody here today. Chandler, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please?